Hi, my name is John Lambert, aka Noise Dosage Media, and I will be your guide throughout this journey. Thank you so much for clicking my documentary film Between Exultation and Aggression 2 in support of my podcast. At an early age, extreme music had become a very important part of my life. Almost every weekend I spend in small venues or basements seeing underground bands throughout upstate New York. With time, my love for concert photography and videography grew as a result of wanting to learn something new. I've been hooked ever since. My journey into extreme music started at Watchman Studios in Lockport, New York, when I was recording with my high school band. This enabled me to go to underground shows and witness Anthropic, the legendary underground grindcore band. I hope this footage will offer insight into the events that form my love for this style of music. Yeah. Let's lay a pass with that. I didn't like the one. It's fine. Yeah. No, I I, uh, I just want to hear how much ring we got going. Yep. Like, I like a little. Oh, yeah. Just trying not to say anger it. <laughs> <laughs> to dive deeper into the culture of extreme metal, connecting with bands from all over the United States to uncover their stories of passion and love for the genre. I did this simply by asking for their time while catching them on tour. These are the questions I would ask them. The first question I'd ask would be to find out what memorable stories they have from playing their music in front of audiences around the world. I've been on the road just about 17 years now, and it is a trip, I'll say that, because as much as you kind of think you have it figured out, like you know, hey, this is what happens on tour, this is what it feels like, somehow you can still get new experiences. Just when you think you've seen it all, somehow something new still happens, you know? Um, and specifically on this tour, you know, we're doing the 15 years for our first record. And that's kind of a trip because I remember when we were performing these songs for the first time, and to kind of go back to them, it's almost like a bit of a time warp because, you know, it just kind of feels like very, like almost uh, like we went full circle. It is a lot of the same repetition, you know? You're waking up in a new city every day. You gotta figure it out every day. The room sounds different every day. You know, the audience is a little different every day. So I, I think what it really is, is you, it's just kind of, you gotta be ready for anything even the stuff you expect and the stuff you don't expect. So we're doing this bunch of international shows all back to back. It's like gonna be like a six week run all together. And we leave LA, we fly to Amsterdam, it's 11 hour flight. Amsterdam down to South Africa, Johannesburg, another 11 hour flight. We play a festival down there in South Africa. And then we're going to St. Petersburg, Russia, which is completely different hemisphere, like different continent all the way at the top. You know, and so it's this insane flight 
out of South Africa to Dubai to Germany and then to St. Petersburg, Russia. It was like two days of flying. Okay, so everything goes on the plane. We leave, uh, we leave South Africa and we're headed to Russia. We get to Russia two days later. All these crazy flights. Half the gear didn't make it. We have to play two weeks worth of tours with half of our gear in Russia because it's stuck in Germany and it's not getting into Russia because there's a customs holdup. So what we had to do was we, we, had, we had two different tunings in our set. So thankfully we had one set of tunings with us and then the other one was not there. But what we had to do was completely switch the setup, like, com like pick all different songs because we're only in this one tuning, like kind of figure those songs out again. We weren't planning on playing them or we hadn't played them in a long time or you're picking songs you don't normally play but you need to for the tuning to make a full set. That was a big obstacle, you know, because we're totally changing our set. We're not even really performing the songs on the record we're touring on because the guitars and that tuning didn't show up. It's just stuff like that. It kind of goes back to that expect anything and everything, you know. Playing is like the most joyful, cathartic experience in my life that I've like as far as as far as like something to do, like an action. That's like I don't know. Uh, most of touring kind of sucks. Like traveling, I mean, it's then there's a novelty for traveling for sure, but it sucks being away from your family and it sucks being away and like being tired and uncomfortable and in weird places. Um, but like the 30 or 40 minutes that we play has been like. From the moment I played my first show, it's like all I wanted to do. Um, I think I started playing shows when I was like 13 or something, and uh, I quit every other hobby I had. Like I quit Boy Scouts and band and all kind and orchestra and all that shit, which is kind of silly. I shouldn't have quit all that stuff, but all I wanted to do was play shows. That's it. So every weekend I could, when I had a band that played shows, I would play shows every weekend. And when I graduated high school, I booked my first tour for my first band. And we toured like did the, this horrible nine-day tour around PA in Ohio, and uh, it was the best time ever. And then you know, I just figured out how to keep touring. Three days ago, uh, this kid, actually I don't know if it was a kid. Three days ago, we were playing in Chicago, and um, two songs in, I just saw something fly onto the stage. I thought it was a beer can, and it was a dead gutted rat. Someone threw it on stage, <laughs> and it landed on Spencer's pedals and shit, and guts went all over his set list and his pedals and he kicked the rat and uh, we never figured out who did the rat but I was holding the rat up showing people and it's kind of sad. Back in 2015 some crusty kids were hitching up to Death Fest and we were playing Nashville and they showed up at the show and they had a kidney in a bag and they traded us a kidney for a t-shirt. Pretty weird. <laughs> Kind of music is such a expressive outlet, um, but a lot of what I write my music about is um, a lot of trauma-based, um, a lot of anger, which and rage, which I feel translates well into our live show. So um, I think that it's for me just um, a really great way to kind of cope with the things that I've written about and. Um, process the things that I've written about. You know, there were uh, like Fragments for a Bitter Memory, for example. That title track was, it's about a topic I've been meaning to write about for a long time, but it's kind of stuff that was all buried up. And so being able to talk about it and normalize those words and hearing how other people relate, like, you know, and that's part of why I do this is just because I feel so embraced by the community and other people, and that's what always attracted me to heavy music. We were on tour with The Devil Wears Prada and Stray From The Path, and um, I had written a song called Until Morning Comes about the passing of my cousin who died in a tragic accident, and um, it was also the same week that uh, Riley Gale from Power Trip had passed away, so rest in peace. I had kind of written this song about uh, my mourning and the collective mourning of you know people within our um, community, and um, actually, the anniversary of his death, we were playing Mesa, and I had a mom and her son come up to me and tell me that uh, their dad and husband had passed away, 
Um, and that was a really emotional moment. I was on the verge of tears and we hugged and um, stuff like that happens a lot. People share their stories and are really vulnerable with me. For them to come up and approach me that day specifically about that song on the anniversary of my cousin's death was that I wrote the song about was like, I felt like that was meant to happen in a way, you know, an extra piece of closure. On this tour, we're on tour with Counterparts and CSB's Cowboy and Foreign Hands right now. We have played Portland, our hometown, so many times I can't even count. And, you know, uh, I hadn't really felt like we had had that hometown show that like broke through yet. And from beginning to end, the whole set that we played on this tour at home was like, this is what we have been working for. This is the moment in our careers that we built up to was a reaction like this, you know, like, it almost felt like um, we were a headliner, like an anniversary or something like that. So after being on tour for eight months, it really paid off. And for it to be in our hometown, it was really emotional. the feeling is more so much like uh, it's like a sense of validation you know and you you know we work forever on these songs to the point where you hate them mixing mastering all that bullshit and then you um, you bored of them and then playing them live with your band to a crowd that likes that song is such an affirming moment where you just feel so uh, like the magic of the song comes back to life and you're just like, I'm in, you know, Eastern Europe right now, thousands of miles from home playing for people that know my tunes. Like what a, what a, what a cool sensation. Just it's not the major seven chords I'm playing. It's the fact that we're communicating with our instruments is the real jazz part of what we do. Yeah. It's the, conversation that we have the flux and uh, oscillation of tempo and energy that's what is really makes us stand out from the other metal bands and I have nothing against people that play to a click track or any of that stuff but I would never want to do that it sounds so stressful and it doesn't sound that that fun for me at least like what I enjoy is listening to the band and you know we have a conversation we talk to each other we can't communicate with our mouths because we have fucking masks on so the only way we can uh, express anything to each other is with our instruments you see all across this great nation good law-abiding devil-worshipping Satanists are being I caught you, motherfucker, praying the rosary and going to church twice on Sundays. <laughs> but I will take the Jesus out of you, and I will heal this man. Be your God. <laughs> with this really stupid bit where we all dress like Spider-Man. <laughs> so like the idea was it was gonna be the, like we were gonna be the Avengers or something, but like no one got the memo. So I kept like introducing different members. It's like, all right, we got Captain America. And then like Brett would come out dressed like Spider-Man and be like, what? Like, dude, you were supposed to be the Hulk or whatever. And like, so we did like this whole bit uh, and, we, and, and we each got like really just like shitty like Spider-Man Halloween costumes from like like Spirit Halloween or something like that, but they were all different. So like, Brett I think had like a like a, a jacked like Spider-Man costume with like padding in it. Like like Ash had some real budget Spider-Man costume. I had like the actual like 
full on like, you know, skin tight like suit. And I think I had to like cut holes in the fingers so that I could like, you know, play guitar. But I kept the thing on for like the whole set. And yeah, man, it was like brutal singing in that thing. It was a headline set too. So I was like, you know, a good full hour. And it was like a packed, packed show. Um, so it was just like hot. Uh, I think it was at like the, the Opera House, I want to say in Toronto. Um, but yeah, that's definitely like a unforgettable night. There's something about playing live for, for people who respond back to you that you just can't like, you know, I like, I'm probably legit addicted to it because it's like, it's fucking awesome. And it's like, you can't, you can't really like bottle that up and quantify that in any other aspect of like life. And it's like the only, it's like, this is the only way I can get it. And you know, it's fun. And I, I also like bringing joy to other people and you know, music does that. I, I, I've talked to other people who play different styles of music and they, you know, they tell me the same thing. I have a homie who's, a, he's in a rap group and he's like, yo, it's like, I, like he told me, he's like, dude, I understand like why you do Creeping Death and why you even play in, in local hardcore bands and local bands, like just for fun, like around town. It's like, there's nothing like the rush of like performing for people. You know what I mean? It's just like, there's just nothing in the world like it, you know? There's very few things like it. Like you said, jumping out of planes and shit. Like, maybe you can get out of that. I've never done that, but like, you know, jumping out of planes and riding dirt bikes and shit like that. Like, that's the only type of stuff when I'm like, when I feel that like adrenaline, that fun aspect. The only other time I've had it, like you said, you were <laughs> jumping out of planes. For me, it was like when I used to ride dirt bikes and I would, you know, jump a double or something like that or hit something real nice, like, that was like, okay, like, I felt that, you know, you get that rush, that, that sort of like, that tingle, that juice, you know what I mean? And like, haven't really found it since, except for playing music, so. One time we played this show, uh, really early on, we were pretty young. Um, nobody went to the show, maybe like, maybe two people. And we had nowhere to stay, so at the end of the night, the guy that managed the room um, offered us a place to stay. He was kind of seemed like cracked out, kind of, you know, but like nice enough. And we were young and we had no money, nowhere to go. So we were like, fuck it, let's give it a shot. So we drive over to this guy's place. Uh, we're pulling up and he, he runs out of his house and he runs up to the door and he opens the van and he throws a cat in the van. And this cat's like, bah, bah. it's so fucked up. We're just like, what the fuck? Why would this guy do that? So that's weird. Cat runs off that he doesn't care. Um, then he leads us into the house and every door, it's this big old house, the floors are dirt, and every door is padlocked. And like one of the rooms, there's definitely a dude inside, one of the non-padlocked ones, um, there's a dude inside and he's making like really loud ass house music. It's like two in the morning, it's just like poof, poof, poof. He's like, uh, you guys can sleep wherever you want. Some people can sleep in the murder room. And I was like, okay. And me and my friend were like, let's just go to the murder room to sleep. So we went all the way up to the third floor into their attic, and it was painted entirely black floor to ceiling. She was, was fine, whatever. So we lay down and we're going to sleep and I'm laying there and I look up and there's this huge world map across the wall and I just see the world map like blow like that. And it turns out the wall was like destroyed. There was no wall. It was just like to the outside. So it was just like a cold breeze because there was no wall. And uh, when we woke up, I went down there to the living room, you know, to get ready to leave. And some of the guys were down there and there was like a like a gynecologist gurney type thing, like the chair with the stirrups in the living room for the for the table. That was the table. I wake up at 6 a.m. in Pittsburgh and uh, 
I gotta throw up and I immediately go to the toilet and it's like whew, shit and throw up nonstop, you know? And I'm so I'm like, it must be 12 hours straight of that. And I'm like, I didn't know what to do, you know? So I'm like, I'm not, I don't wanna play. And they're like, you gotta play. So as, uh, as we're going down the highway, I, uh, I full on just get out and go throw up full on shit in my pants and it's, it's a knee high blizzard. It's like past my knee. So I'm like in the snow, I'm naked and I'm dying. Everybody in the van's laughing. They're like, they're losing their mind about this. You know what I mean? Just like while I'm in pure misery, truckers are beeping at me down the highway. Why I'm like trying to get cleaned up, you know, and I'm, and I'm still throwing up every 30 minutes after that. And this is probably at like 4 PM. We'll be play at like nine. So I still have hours of this to deal with. So I'm just in the bathroom, people hear me dying the whole time, the whole show. They give me a little cardboard box the whole time we're playing. I'm, you know, I'm blasting and everything and people are just like, fuck. And like they could see I'm just like ugh, dry heaving the whole time we're playing, you know what I mean? Cause I took some like anti-nausea pills. Throwing up nonstop. I'm, so finally I can get some out like halfway through the set, but every song everybody's cheering harder, you know what I mean? Like, like oh, I got through one more, one more, like, ah, oh, and I'm like, Every song, I'm like, can we just cut the set short? You know what I mean? But made it through, got done the whole the whole set. Now I can say I've probably went through like the most miserable, besides like breaking something where I can't play, it's probably the most miserable thing to happen to you while you're playing. I met this guy named Gaston in Argentina, and um, I was down there with Nuke, and he came up to me and was telling me about all the bands I'm in in Rochester and then all the bands that are from Rochester. So this dude had like an investment in the scene up here. And the more we talked, he has been following my music for a while. And I'm like, how the fuck does anyone in Argentina know even my name? Or, you know, cause I don't, I don't know. I don't, I try not to float a boat or anything, man. I just try and write music that makes me feel good. And fucking, it's, it just blows my mind. And I'll talk to him and I'll fucking start tearing up just because the guy's so fucking great, you know? And it's so cool to, it's, it, the fact that you can connect like that with someone and then and then you're and now you're you know now you're bros you know it's fucking cool um you know you don't do this shit for girls or any of that stupid shit you know i definitely don't do it for money and 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 um i just i do it it's basically for that so you can fucking hang out with a bunch of dudes in black t-shirts and fucking smoke a little weed out in the parking lot and fucking just fucking chum it down you know and be like dude your new record sounds sick you know what are you up to and just fucking it's it's awesome man you know people in our shit want to they they want to fucking high five and want to give you a sweaty hug and want to fucking and and, and want to make it deeper you know so it's it's cool Salako played we opened for mastodon it was here at anthology and two days later i got a message through uh, Facebook Messenger, and uh, uh, it was this guy Jerry, and he's just out of nowhere. He's like, "I saw you. I saw Salako play. I never heard of you guys before, and uh, I really, I really enjoyed the style, you know. And I'm trying to get into playing guitar, and and uh, uh, I was just wondering if you know maybe you could give me some lessons or something, and and." I don't know fucking shit about playing guitar. I don't, I barely know the letters on the fucking strings. I just know how to make sound with it. And I'm a one trick pony. I can't fucking play. I've tried other, doing other bands that are more rocky and it turns right into a fucking grindcore song or it turns into fucking something else. And it's, it's, I, I just can't veer. I'm, I'm on a fucking train to nowhere. And, uh, but, so I told him that. I said, look, man, I can't give you, like, technical fucking lessons or anything, but I could show you a few tunes. I could show you just a couple little things that I do. And uh, uh, I wound up showing him some stuff, and I think, I, I think some of it stuck. But we jammed for a while, and, uh, uh, and he's been... And after that itch that he said that I helped him scratch, he's like jams with a drummer now and he's got a few guitars and he's got you know he invested in the gear we often overlook the immense power that this genre has bestowed upon individuals especially those who don't give it a chance this prompted me to ask how this type of music has truly transformed people's lives in a positive way i think on a like on an emotional level i think heavy music is is like a purge it's kind of like a rage room it's where it's like i think why sometimes People always trip out like, oh, you know, metal fans are so chill the rest of the time when they're not at a show. And it's like, 
well yeah because we got it all out that's why we're chill is we just screw screaming our asses off for an hour like so now it's all good and I think that it's like a, obviously that's a reduction but I think the idea of like scream therapy is a real thing because what yeah I've been on tour for a long time pandemic comes along I'm sitting at home for a long time I started wondering like where's all this why am I mad all the time I'm just freaking mad I just wake up mad walk around mad like where like where'd my patience go like I have no patience anymore what happened and I realized oh it's because I'm not like going through this like purge where this performance where you get all this shit out of you and then you're like whew that feels good go ahead and relax now and I really think that's what was going on because now that we've been back on the road for a few months or about a year now last September um, I like feel back to myself again and I really think it's like I think that heavy music is an outlet for you know all the, all the shit you got bouncing around up here that, that makes you uncomfortable you know makes you anxious all that stuff so I would say that's one thing I've noticed about it but also like purpose you know for me like I was I really didn't know necessarily what I was gonna where I was gonna end up like I was it was basically I was at the point where the job I was working wasn't you know I was driving trucks uh, was, we're hauling asphalt doing roads um, and I live in Southern California so there's like a lot of building happening all the time so we're just doing road construction all the time and I was a kind of a dead-end job for me you're basically just holding the steering wheel hauling asphalt and so it was kind of like well I'm either gonna join the military or like try to go back to school maybe but I don't even know what I want to go for and then the band happened so I think it gave me like a real sense of purpose and it's why Sean and I like took it so serious we're like he had been in so many bands and never went anywhere. So did I. I felt like, well, this is my last shot right here. Like, I'm gonna try it, and if, if it doesn't go, then oh well. Like, how many times can you try? So we took it super serious, and I think it, that sense of purpose was very good for us. Like, kept us focused, kept us on the road. Like, we matured a lot. You know, you gotta run a business now, right? How much money do we make? What's it cost to get you to the next show? What's it cost to eat? What's the hotel cost? Like. We all grew up real fast, like having to figure that stuff out. And so I think it just gave us experience, purpose. Um, obviously the fans, everybody we've met, lifesavers for me, you know, took away that loneliness. So yeah, everything. <laughs> It's funny that you just said most people look at metal like outsiders and think, oh gosh, get that out of here. You know, this is this is horrible. You must have a horrible life or you, you must be so negative because you have a black t-shirt on or something like that, you know. Um, no, this music and, and me playing music, metal music specifically, has been so positive in my life. If you, if you get into our uh, lyrics and you look at the overall idea of them, well, they come from one point and it's our all collective dilemma and and sadness of seeing people we know have problems with hard drugs and ruining their life because of it um, you know it hasn't happened to us specifically but the effects of other people having that happen to them affects everyone they know and it's really sad and it's something we don't you know you, you when you see someone ruin their life like that uh, you hope they come back from it first of all and sometimes they do and that's great but the people that didn't, all my, the people that I know who have died, it's just so frustrating. It's so frustrating that you don't know what to do. You, you, like, I don't even know what to say about it. It, it just sucks so bad. So sometimes uh, it feels great to take that anger and all that emotion and turn it into something positive, which is metal. Now it sounds harsh as hell. You show it to an average person, you, you tell them to listen to Determined to Rod or something like that, they're gonna say, oh, what the hell is this, you know? But it, it, that's the whole point. Uh, you take all that, how bad you feel about something and turn it into something else. And that's, that's where metal comes for us, or for me. And uh, that is so positive because it ch takes a horrible, negative situation and somehow transforms it even in a small way to something that's more positive. So, and I know they don't like really outweigh each other or whatever, but still that that's the bottom line. I think that helps us out a lot. And then another thing too is 
uh, if we ever mention that at shows or we talk to fans about that, if someone finds that out and they have the same problems in their life, they really appreciate hearing our approach on it and we connect over that. And uh, oh man, it just gives me goosebumps. All my friends in the world, pretty much, <laughs> my wife, who I met at a show, uh, like it, it, it pays my bills, you know, pretty much now. Um, and it exposes me to other mediums. Like I've met artists that paint and videographers and like just tons of talented people in other ways. And I've, it just exposes me. It's, it's allowed me to travel all over the world. Um, so culturally, it's given me a lot. Um, I don't know, it's also like the most important thing I think is that like, I think human beings have this like really serious innate pull a lot of times to like want what they don't have like what's on the other side of the fence and they think like you know you just you, I think you're just naturally curious and you naturally think like well that might be better but this band allows me to like travel all over and see how experiences are the same all over the world and like the only real difference for me personally just you know I'm, I'm not saying this is like a blanket statement but for me personally the only difference is like the people that I like care about a lot, you know, they live in Pennsylvania. I don't want to leave Pennsylvania. I'm cool with living in the middle of fucking nowhere because I've seen cities and I get to see stuff and like, it's no different, you know? So I don't know. It's made me like grateful for my home too. Like the balance allows me to appreciate both. Cause I also think you can't have like a, I think a constant regular kind of like leads you to like a malaise, you know, you just kind of, like that episode of Spongebob where Squidward goes to the Squid Village. It's a full-on release, like any tension that's in, in me or anything like that. So to me, it's 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 changed my life and for the better, because who knows what the hell I'd be doing if it wasn't for this, you know what I mean? It's, and I think it comes to the music at the same time, because I this is all I have in my life and it's all I want to do, you know what I mean? I have like a full-on, tonal vision of like, I just want to play music non-stop forever. This song goes out to my friend Ryan. It's about killing your abusive life. I'd say I have two chapters. Um, the first chapter is me discovering heavy music and being a kid and going to shows and I moved around a lot, so you know, I didn't always have a lot of friends or really felt like I belonged because I was constantly in motion. Um, but once I started going to um, specifically hardcore shows when I was a kid, I was like, wow, you know, like these people are just like me. We're all a bunch of weirdos. We're all a bunch of outcasts, you know? And um, so that, that sense of belonging was like my first chapter of what makes this so special to me. And the second chapter is when I started a band. And I'd always wanted to make music. Um, I've sang my whole life, but there's just something about this kind of music that just really resonates with me and um, I think is really special. And um, so starting a band was like my second phase where I was like, okay, not only do I belong in this space, but I want to create here as well. You know, there's tons of people who are, you know, people who grew up in the hardcore scene, working in the music industry for bigger names and stuff like that. And um, just by booking small hardcore shows, I'd found my way into working at a venue as a production manager and eventually a buyer. So um, that's that second avenue that you had mentioned. Like, you know, once hardcore is just like this really awesome smaller community, but it really opens up a lot of opportunities and um, you know, paths for people like me to pursue a career in music. Beyond being a musician, I think I'm an artist, which is like the douchiest thing anyone could say, but in truth, it is uh, how I feel. And I think as an artist, I just need like a creative outlet and it can be any avenue an artist wants. But for me, like I really felt like I wanted to do death metal or whatever genre you want to call us. And I really, connect with that and I like, enjoy the exploration, a creative opportunity. And so it brings me that, which is, you know, as any artist or musician will tell you, like they have that internal uh, voice telling them to make something. You, 
you got to make something you know you don't just want to go to work so you can come back and chill and like live a great life i mean really, i'm from new york man i could have worked on wall street if i wanted that's what i mean it would have been fine but that would i that would kill me yeah. <laughs> i mean that would fucking kill me and i don't yeah so i was just you know very often you can think like oh i would make so much more money doing this that but instead i have to make something i gotta create so death metal is my outlet metal is kind of everything to me i mean i love different types of music for sure but i mean metal is my career it's my my main sort of creative outlet for expression um it's my main f friend group is like our, our mainly metal heads um yeah it's, it's just like such a huge part of my life um it's, it kind of affects like every facet of my of my well-being and i've been very fortunate where i can you know say that you know music truly is my main job i know a lot of different people have to have different side hustles when they get home from tour um but yeah i've, I've made music like my number one thing I, I i teach when i'm home um i you know, work with different companies so like you know i, I have like the tab books so like when we put out a record, we'll also have like tab books to accompany that. So that's like one way to kind of keep up with like, I guess like a passive income stream. Um, certainly like working with like Jackson guitars that like also helps too. I have like my signature, um, you know, line of warriors. So um, I think it's good to diversify, right? As much as you can, if, if you can. So like, you know, I can come home and I can teach, um, but then I have like the guitars that like, are also sort of selling like in the background um, and and all of that you know contributes to being able to do what I love for a living I mean for me um, like, I, like I love to teach um, but obviously like I mean performing and going out in the road um, that's just like my favorite thing to do ever so um, being able to like still be involved with music and feel like I can keep my like my mind sharp with music and stay up to date with everything and because like when you're teaching you obviously uh you have to you know be at the top of your game because you're, you're you know whether it's a technique or something theoretical you know you have to be able to break it down and explain it to people so and sometimes people don't understand it you know um with the first explanation so you have to kind of get creative with like how you explain things to different students so that it clicks with them so you know just the fact that i'm like constantly working on music whether i'm on the road playing it every night or i'm at home teaching it or when I'm in a writing phase um, yeah I feel like just music envelops every part of my life it's pretty much kept me together most of my years you know I kind of lived for extreme metal it, you know it helps with all the bad times in life it it helps with you know when you're feeling down feeling depressed you come home you fucking throw on some deicide next thing you know you're fucking washing your living room you know what I mean it, it just, it gives you like power, it gives you strength, it just empowers you, it just pushes you and kind of gives you confidence in, in, in the sense that like you can overcome whatever the shit's fucking, it's, it's not for weak people, it, it's, it's music for strong extreme people. You know, I've been playing music since, well, like 36 years, something like that, so you know, just over the years of touring and traveling to all different parts of the world and just meeting all kinds of um, people from different backgrounds, different cultures and stuff. But in the end of the day, we're all the same, you know, and we have this passion for music and this, um, this um, you know, the, the, this unity that brings everybody together, you know under music and for me it's like you know even though we play i guess you would consider it a negative the negative side of music for me it's a very positive force um that you know brings a lot of hope to a lot of people so that's one of the things that it's it's a very unifying force you know through music i've met some of my closest friends you know i have friends all over the world that i you know i've been friends with since the 80s you know from tape trading and stuff like that and and uh you know some of the greatest people you can ever meet you know and um for me that's just like the biggest blessing out of um you know playing music you know um 
is just meeting all the amazing people that um, I've met over the years and the long lasting friendships that, you know, that I've made. Um, you know, because um, it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to find people that are like minded and um, kind of free spirits, you know? And I think that's the thing about uh, music in general, whatever genre of music that you play, is that we are kind of like um, the truth seekers in a sense, you know, and looking for the truth and looking for some, some answers out there. And, uh, you know, so I think uh, that's one of the amazing things. It's just all the amazing people that I've connected with over the years. Now, there are obviously some things you need to consider before jumping into a serious tour heavy band. I wanted to examine the mindset of how simple it is to hit it big in the music industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so easy. In fact, it's so easy that I was like, you know what, this time I want to challenge. Let me switch it up to death metal because I'm, I'm just killing it too much. There's too many zeros in, in my bank account right now. I need to mix it up. Give me a challenge. All right, let's do death metal. You're definitely not going to get a lot of girls in this genre, but I think there's definitely way worse, harder genres to like really do something in. You know, there are bands that are making money and, and making a career in this genre, you know? So that's something worth noting and it's something that's valuable. So it's possible. There are definitely genres of music that it's not possible or it's just too niche. And, uh, but like I said, that's my, that's what I love is the creativity of it all. Like here we are selling a product that is defying you to like it. And I have to figure out a way to make a career out of it. And I like that. That's kind of fun and challenging. And, and we've navigated certain parts of the industry that allow us to, uh, capitalize on these opportunities. And it's really been. Uh, a fun process for us and you know it's all to the support of our fans really they're the one that keeps us the ones that keep us able to make more music so that's really uh well, we're truly grateful for it man not good um, it's almost like you wonder like like you have normal people ask you uh, oh you're going to New York City whoa oh my gosh uh, you're like how much you're gonna make that's the first thing and you're like oh well if we're lucky on on just getting to pay to play and selling merchandise and all, and all those things together and albums and whatnot if we can get all three of those very well like executed then we can maybe break even on going there and coming back and getting some good pizza and stuff like that. They're like, what? What the hell? You know, they're thinking of like Bob Seger going somewhere and having a nice uh, hotel and getting paid like th hundreds of thousands of dollars. It doesn't happen that way. And, and you're not just gonna jump right into it. Some people have like gotten lucky and gotten like, like done really well, really quick. But that's what it is. It is, it is luck. And, and yes, they have, great, they have good music too, for sure. But it's like, if you think that it's going to turn into some big time job and you're going to be like Cannibal Corpse, oh man, you 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 have another thing to uh, you have another thing coming. And and uh, like the first question you asked, why do, like why do we still do it then? You know, well because you love it, because you have a big passion about it, and because it's really cool to meet these people and stuff like that. Like I said too, with me, I cannot I cannot relax and sit sit around. I can't do that. I like to come outside and or go anywhere and meet people like you and meet people like everyone in here.
you gotta evaluate your own sanity because <laughs> uh, being on the road is definitely not for everyone. Um, I mean, it, it's it's hard. It's it's long drives. It's you know, you're only on stage for especially if you're first starting out. I mean, you're probably gonna only be on stage for a half hour uh, at a time. So I mean, your whole day leads up to that one half hour, forty minute moment, and everything else is, you know, being in the van, loading in the gear, driving for hours on end on no sleep to get to the next city so you know you, you definitely have to make sure that it's it's for you um, but try it out right you know you're never gonna know unless you do it um, you gotta in, in terms of more like practical things like got to evaluate your finances like so you know you don't want to be like on tour in the middle of the tour and like you run out of dough um, so if, if, uh, if you got to go home and work those overtime shifts or just hustle that much harder or like work on the weekends like you know have a nice little nest egg set aside so that uh you know you don't have to call uh mommy and daddy for for dough when you're out on the road and you're and you're broke and you you know down to your last packet of ramen um but hey if you got rich parents that's that's even better <laughs> you, know, you don't have to worry about it <laughs> Uh, I didn't have that luxury, but uh, my, my, my family was always supportive of me, which is which was nice. Um, you know, you might want to take you you might want to evaluate like where you're at in terms of like relationships, like those types of things. Like, you know, going on the road um, can be very difficult um, to you know maintain like good solid relationships. So I think it's important to you know if, if you have a partner to be uh, you know very communicative with them and um, you know make sure you're both on the same page. Um, cause it's, you know, it's a tough lifestyle and it, and it definitely, um, you know, takes, a, takes you away from, from your loved ones. So, you know, just take all those things into consideration. But, um, I, I think the people that are really have that kind of, I mean, it's, it's almost like an addiction really, like, you know, to, to going out and, and playing live, you're going to, you're going to find a way to do it no matter what, because it, it just feeds a certain part of your soul that like nothing else can really compare to, um, so no matter what, if you've got it in you, you're gonna throw caution in the wind and just make it happen. Um, but if you're, if you're not in it 100%, um, it'll, it, it'll show you, uh, if you, if you're, if you're really in it or not going on, on tour. My best advice would be to do it when you're young because it's more socially acceptable and possible to be broke as fuck when you're young than it is when you're in your 30s or something and you actually have like responsibilities. We started Full of Hell when Dave was like 15 years old. We were like all kids. Uh, I was like 19, Spencer was 19. Um, but you know, I was like a fresh college dropout. Uh, you know, and it was possible for me and, and us and all of us to, to survive because you know, we were just like losers living at home working like simple jobs when we got home and it wasn't as big of a deal. But it took like years and years and years and like we just loved it so much that every step of the process was amazing for us at the time. And like I would say that's really important too. I always get really confused if I talk to someone that's like so goal oriented that they're looking at this destination and I just like, I just like it's an illusion, you know what I mean? So I think it's important to love it even if it gives you nothing but the opportunity to play. Because I think uh, I think it's kind of silly to expect more of it, and I also think that like if you lean too heavily on like someone else's parameters for what success means, I think uh, kind of goes against like the meaning of art in in the first place, and it like sucks the soul out of it. It's easy as an artist to get, you know, uh, bogged down or feel feel pressure or stress about what you're doing. But like what I mentioned, the validation of playing for people feels keeps you going. Making money as a musician keeps you going. And then uh, also just like hearing artists that are also like, you know, uh, more successful than me or bigger than me or whatever. They'll tell me just stay stubborn, stay focused, don't have a plan B. Like stuff like that keeps me uh, on the right path and keeps me, you know, uh, driven, I guess.
And that's the toughest thing about being a musician. Do you want to torture yourself in order to make something? If someone wants to leave your band, are you committed enough to find a replacement? Or are you just fold? You know, there's stuff like that. My lineup's not the original lineup, but I didn't quit. And it's that's, that's tough, so anyone that is able to keep moving, I think is important. But it's also just like, you know, you gotta have fun, man. And I'll never be the type of band that says like, oh geez, oh, there's no stage. Or, or even worse, oh the stage is only this big. Uh, or, or, or even worse, oh there's no monitors. Or even worse, uh, uh, oh it's that PA. You know, f I, I, fuck it. Uh, give me the shittiest stuff as long as we have somewhere to plug in that's not gonna electrocute me, which does happen a lot and we still play. Uh, so that's, you know, that's where we are with that. As, as long as we have, um, a good place to just get together and have some music and and and, and uh, see some music with our friends. That's all you need. And that's another thing too. If there's any uh, young bands out there that I'm pretty sure everyone knows how things work now with the internet and stuff. But it, it, you know, if, uh, sometimes I hear people say like, "How how did you get into this venue in Toledo where we live?" And I say, "Well, uh, just just just." First of all, go meet the people, say hi, shake their hand, you know, but also play some shows. If you're having a tough time getting an answer back from somewhere, make your own show, and then the same place is gonna say, oh, cool, I see these guys are playing shows, I'll have them play here, you know, this is how it goes. So it's clear the process isn't easy, but what is the most fulfilling part of doing things all DIY with your band? Here's the thing, with the, with the music industry, it's easy to lose control of your band, you know? And I think that happens to a lot of bands. Um, and, you know, we, we never did. We, we've always, like, really kept it, uh, yeah, I mean, DIY is the dumbest thing to say, but, it, yeah, we, we are doing it ourselves. You know, it's like we do our own accounting. I, we manage ourselves. We work directly with our merch printing company. We hire our own crew. Like, they're people we know. It's not management just flying people in, which is very common. Um, you know, we we write all of our songs, you know what I mean? We don't write with ghostwriters or producers or people who aren't in the band, which is also very common, you know? Um, so I would say, you know, it's just, it's been a very real expression of art. That's why every record's a little bit different. There's a way around it and you can hold it in your own hands the whole way. I think it's just like, that's gonna be so much more meaningful, especially because like, like I was saying, like this shit's not real. Like no band lasts forever. No band stays good forever. Like it's gonna end, you're gonna die. You might as well do it the right way. Do it yourself. Don't like make it cheap by letting some fucking corporation touch it. The type of music we play, like whatever you want to call it, it's not marketable. It would be such a hilarious joke to like even go for it. And then someone's gonna fucking ruin it and make it terrible on top of that. So I just think it would be foolish to pursue that path for a lot of people, especially people that play extreme music. I just think it's foolish. Like. Do everything you can, but like, don't give away your shit to some like someone who doesn't care. Don't allow like people that aren't passionate, at least to a degree, you know, um, work with you. I, I don't like working with people. I don't like trying to convince people to work with us. I don't like. I don't know. I just don't like the anonymity of it. I like to work with our friends. So and we've made compromises over the years working with people that we don't know, and you know that's how you make new friends. But I don't know, as time goes on and we get older, I just see that like, there's probably a lot more inherent value, you know, monetarily and, you know, spiritually to keeping it in house. <laughs> there's a lot of work. I don't know if I love being DIY, it's just, it's just how it has to be. I guess the one thing I'll just circle back to, like I have been ranting about this whole time, is like the creative puzzle, you know? It's Imperial Triumph. How do we put on a crazy rock show? And all the things that we do, like on stage, 
it's always an evolution and it's always coming very organically and natural and uh, aesthetically symmetrical. You know, the bigger we get, the more production we will be able to put into our stage show and the, the crazier it will get. If you really like to do something, there's there's two ways of looking at it too. There's some people that are like, oh, that's all I want to do, that's all I meant for, I have to do this. Okay, well then you have to really get your, your, your shit together so that you can do it. You can't only just focus on that or else everything else will fall apart. You won't have anywhere to live. You won't be able to buy a microphone. You can't buy a guitar. You know, um, that would make it hard if you don't have your stuff together. Now, and, and we talked about how the reward's not very high money-wise, but the reward of like, just uh, in life is great, it's really high. So if you start dedicating a lot of time and effort to something and you keep going and you keep persisting through the hard times and breaking down and all that stuff, it will get better and it does get better because people notice and people appreciate it. And that's all it really takes. The main thing is to get in front of someone and to get in front of them, like I said, you have to have a vehicle, you have to have gear, you have to have all that stuff. And then the time to be able to write the songs, the time to have connections, to get to be able to meet the promoters, all that stuff. So even though it's kind of funny looking back on it and you say like, oh, it's, it's hard, it's this and that, it's still worth it. And if someone really wants to do it, you have to be smart about it and it will happen. I believe that this kind of music is supposed to be the antithesis to what normal societal culture is like. And, you know, our society is very corporate. And I think that it's really cool when you do things without Live Nation and you do things without Ticketmaster and you can just do it on your own based off of the work of the community as a whole um, without any bullshit. I've just always been like a hands-on kind of do when it comes to this band like I I like to reach out to the artists to you know get album covers and explain my ideas or even just for like t-shirts like you know I'll reach out and have a very specific idea in mind maybe it's inspired by a song like I just like enjoy doing that and I think I'm obviously I'm going to be able to explain my vision like way better than like a band manager or something like that even with music videos too like um, you know coming up with like kind of like a general concept and like bringing that to like a, a video director and kind of hashing it out directly rather than going through like a middleman i feel like i can just get to where i need to go like a little bit quicker at the start of this movie i wanted to explore why this music connects so deeply with me and many other people for me it has always been a place of comfort and connection allowing me to form meaningful relationships and express my feelings I wanted to take a closer look into why this music means so much to me and many others. I wonder if our shared personalities or similar upbringings created these strong connections. Deeper exploration was necessary to find out what ties us all together. Yeah, I mean, I was a huge loner. You know, I spent all, like, 90% of my time I spent by myself. And so I think that's probably where the creativity came from, because I had to keep myself occupied. Um, and you know, my, my parents both worked, you know, quite a bit. So it would just be me and my sister at the house after school. So it's pretty quiet. You know what I mean? My sister was old, six years older than me, so she's doing her thing. Um, so it was, it seemed like I just kind of spent a lot of it living in my head, so to speak, uh, riding my bike around the neighborhood. Uh, and I think that's probably where like the ability of like, oh, I can come up with an idea and that'll be fun. So, you know, I would like build bike tracks all around like the neighborhood because we kind of lived out where there weren't very many houses, like a lot of open fields. So I'd like, you know, draw a bike track and then I'd like ride out there and I'd like start digging it with my shovel and stuff like that. And I, I used to do, um, you know, like, you know, my mom's a teacher her whole life. So everything was really like, academic based for us. So if I wanted to like see a movie or something like that, I had to write a report on it, you know, kind of one for you, one for me situation. And so I think creative writing was sort of implanted in that and just kind of realizing that just because it's writing doesn't mean it's boring if you're writing about something that interests you, you know, or, or however it relates to what's interesting to you. And so I think from that, um, I don't know, when I really started getting into music, I just absorbed all the artwork, the lyrics, the layouts, like what the band members looked like, 
obviously there was no socials back then, so I didn't, there's no like personal, you're not seeing into their personal lives at all, just seeing what you see at the show or on in the magazines or on MTV. Um, like I really was into grunge, like right when I started listening to music, so, you know, I was like 12 years old and it was like uh, STP, you know, Scott Weiland was like my favorite vocalist. I just thought he was the best, you know. Alice in Chains, um, loved Alice, I still love Alice in Chains. Um, you know, Pearl Jam, uh, Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, man, what a front man, right? So those were kind of, that was like my first introduction to like what maybe a live musician is, you know? And I think I was really interested by like the grunge front man and even like uh, Zach De La Rocha from Rage you know Rage was really big back then I mean there was a bunch of vocalists you know um, the guy from Sublime he was always like in interviews and stuff like that and obviously Kurt Cobain you know I remember when he died and what a like you know like what a shock that was to so many people and stuff so I think it was just all those things sort of implanted in my mind that like m musicians are kind of these cultural figures that a lot of people pay attention to especially with where MTV was in the mid 90s it was just like really all about just celebrating these bands you know um, and I guess from there that's when I was like okay well I want to learn an instrument and be in a band so about 13 you know I tried to learn the drums and got okay at them yeah I got okay at them but then in the end it was just like not as fun I don't you know I didn't know why I picked the drums I just was like, okay, drums. And then I got a guitar. Never really got good at guitar. Um, you know, and then it was really just when I started writing and screaming, I I guess I kind of excelled at that because a, like a lot of people that I was trying to write music with were all like, oh, I don't want to have to talk to anybody. I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever. I don't get to talk to anybody, so sure, I'll, t I'll talk to people. I don't care. And so I kind of just ended up as a vocalist, you know, because I think, I wasn't really that great at drums, wasn't really that great at guitar, and then the other people didn't want to be on the mic, so I kind of like ended up there, you know? And I guess I, I enjoyed it. I, I still remember the first show I ever played. Um, it was probably like, you know, four people in the crowd. It was basically like a open stage night at like a neighborhood church, you know? And it wasn't, we weren't there because it was a church. It was just like on Wednesday nights between, you know, seven and eight, you just sign your band up and you can like play for 15 minutes and there's people in the room you know you know it's like really i'm 13 years old i'm very young you know so it was kind of like a, a teen center community center type thing and i remember we you know we played and people watched and and there was you know like kind of head banged or like moved around and i don't know it seemed pretty fun you know and like the thing afterwards people came up and talked to you afterwards and i think that was something that was pretty different for me was because nobody really ever talked to me before. So I think I kind of, you start to realize like, oh, people are interested in musicians, you know, and stuff like that. So I think on a subconscious level, that desire to get attention, just to not be so isolated was really kind of something that, you know, became interesting to like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a screamer now. I was always a really sweet kid. Um, we moved a lot when I was younger. Um, so I'd probably gone to about five or six different schools by the time we ended up um, where I ended up going to high school and graduating. So I wasn't always really good at um, maintaining friends. I, so at a certain point, I just kind of became a loner. I read a lot of books, um, but then I discovered MySpace. And I had, you know, I was very active on MySpace the summer that I moved to a new city. And um, so I, I was definitely a little shy. I would still say I'm shy now. Very goofy. Um, always loved music. I've, been, I've always been very obsessive about music. Um, and I love sports as well. Um, I would say I'm pretty much the same person. I'm just a lot more confident now. I come from like a crazy family, kind of. You know, like at least like uh, a lot of like crime and bad things in my family and stuff like that. So I think maybe growing up, I'd be slightly uh, reserved and scared a lot of times, just in, you know what I mean? It's kind of one of those things where there's something going on in every corner of your house, you know what I mean? People just 
doing crazy shit, you know. Um, a lot of like, you know, just just pure crime, drugs and stuff like that. But my parents were cool. My parents were cool. My dad's like an old outlaw, but my parents were sick, you know. So for me growing up, I'd say I was probably like more reserved and you know at a certain point there's like probably like 14 15 i i started touring in full of hell when i was 15 my first tour and i lied to my parents and didn't tell them i told them i was going they told me no and i was like okay so i just left and then a week later they called me and they're like where are you at and i'm like i'm in texas you know and they're like pissed you know but best decision i made obviously but uh you know, I will say that's probably, that's like the, the breaking point of my life, maybe I think where things were different, I'm more outgoing and stuff like that. When I was in elementary school, we had a fake band called Satan's Penis. We didn't play instruments or anything, but we thought it was like super evil and cool sounding. So, I mean, I always was into bands. My parents are super into music. Um, my personality was the same as it is now. I'm trying, I try to be less obnoxious because I was always like a class clown and I can never shut up. And I still am like that, so, I mean, quieter maybe, but the same as I was when I was a little kid. I've, I'm, I'm living in an environment, uh, personally and professionally, where I'm afforded the opportunity to just be who I am. And, uh, you know, it, when you, like, receive gratitude or when you receive, like, um, good praise for your art or whatever, it, like, lifts you up, like, self-esteem-wise. And I think everybody in the band has, like, owes a lot of their self-esteem and you know ego because everybody's got ego to this this thing that's given so much to us so when you're confident i think you're like more in your own shoes you know and you act like yourself i've never felt a pull to act like anybody else i think i'm a little bit uh <laughs> i guess I, i'm a little bit of the weird one in the way where um and it's this is kind of new to me too <laughs> I, I mean I've, I've been the same my entire life so, this, so me, me, uh, you know, how I act is nothing new, but sometimes people say like, man, you don't ever uh, slow down. You don't ever stop and stuff like that. And uh, that's been me my whole life. Um, that's definitely my personality. I like to do thing, a lot of things. I do not like to stop. I don't like to chill. I don't like to take breaks. Uh, um, my friends made up a good slogan, says if I chill, I'll die. <laughs> No relaxing. That's why I like being in a band too. That's why I think my personality is perfect for at least this band because I really like to get things done. I like to just play a bunch, write a bunch, uh, work on stuff a lot. And, and yeah, and another thing for my personality with the band, we do practice a whole lot, uh, like a couple times a week, uh, a minimum one time a week, usually two to three times a week. And that's just me, I love it. Uh, and like I was telling you when we were setting this stuff up, um, I try to go to shows almost every day, uh, bouncing back and forth between metal shows that I go to a whole lot and jazz shows. I play jazz too, that's a side note thing. And, uh, um, you know, with, with going to those two genres, I can find a show every single day. I think I was, I was outgoing, but I can also be shy. I guess it just depends on the, the situation. Um, I remember like getting into music and, you know, when I was going to like elementary school, like all like the kids there were like really into like sports and stuff. and. It's kind of hard for me to find my like my niche there, um, but once I discovered music and started playing guitar, it was like that was just like all I wanted to do. I just like was obsessed with like bands like Aerosmith, and then I got into Guns N' Roses, and was just like just like playing like in my parents' basement like all the time. Like I would get home from school and just like literally play for like hours and hours on end. Like pretty much from the time I got home to the time like I would like go to bed, I'd be like down like in the basement just like jamming like soloing over songs and like learning little riffs here and there and then I started to write my own music so that I think really gave me like a purpose and then as soon as I hit like middle school like high school like all I wanted to do was just like start a band there's like a, a certain choice of garment that you wear whether band t-shirts so you can kind of spot like other people that are into stuff and even if it's like like you know a punk rock band t-shirt like you know like they're like kind of like adjacent to your like style like in a little bit so like you know I kind of like befriended like people in the metal scene people in the punk scene um and then you know before too long like obviously like got like a band going and just started jamming and um that really felt like i was sort of coming into my own like as soon as like i started like playing shows and like realized there was this whole big like underground scene it like really felt like a, a community and i was keen for people to look back on the album or movie that got them into the darker realm of things how did we all end up down this path what grabbed our attention growing up? These were the questions I could not shake. 
and I had to ask. Cradle of Filth and Demi Bulgir and the two records were uh, Cruelty and the Beast and uh, um, Spiritual Black Dimensions. Those two records is when I was like, oh, I'm fucking evil now. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, cause I think, you know, before that, like the grunge bands or even like Nine Inch Nails, cause I was really into Nine Inch Nails, really into White Zombie, uh, really into Manson, like all that kind of like the shock rock stuff that was coming out in the late nineties, loved all those bands, Mudvayne, like all that stuff. But they were, there was like no, there was like no like religious aspect to any of those bands. They were just like kind of weird looking dudes or, you know, kind of alt looking whatever. But then with Cradle and Dimu, Oh, they're taking it to a whole nother level. Like they, they're like head to toe, you know, crazy makeup, spikes. Everything's got a pentagram on it. Everything's an upside down cross. Like the, all their lyrics are like just gnarly, right? So I think to me that was like, oh well, yeah, black metal's the next, the next. That's like as far as you can go, and that's probably why Carnifex always had a black metal influence from day one. You know, which really permeated the scene years later. You know. Um, I don't know, I just thought, to me it was like, I, I got to black metal before I got to death metal. You know, I, I listened to Cannibal and Fetus and Mortician after uh, Cradle and Demio. So I was actually like, always, I always kind of came in from like the goth side, you know, because it was Nine Inch Nails and Manson and White Zombie and KMFDM and Rammstein and those bands that like put me around the people that were like, oh, have you heard Cradle of Filth? And then there you go, <laughs> you know. I was really young. I mean, had to be like six-ish, something like that. Messing with my bike, maybe working on a bicycle. And I hear on the radio, like a, like a rock station, I hear uh, Thunder Kiss 65 from White Zombie. And be, it, like until that moment, I thought I was like making up metal riffs in my head. Cause you, you could hear metal here and there and like some classic rock or like a, a Ford commercial about trucks, you know, like they have like some cheesy riff in the background. And I would always think like, man, that would be cool if someone like kind of yelling over it or something i don't know what you call it and um it was all like this subconscious stuff i just was like wanting to hear metal then i finally heard it and i was blown away i was so blown away i dropped everything i was doing waited by the radio to listen to uh after the commercials them telling you who just played and i found out okay white zombie so then i asked my uncle you know i'm a young kid my uncle was like into normal normal people metal like like um metallica uh you know this is the early 90s so metallica uh Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, stuff like that. And, he's, and he says, I'm going to the uh, record store. You, you guys want anything? And I said, yeah, 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 I do. I want uh, White Zombie. I was thinking like, yeah, oh, it's not gonna work, but I'll try. And he got it for me. He got me a, a tape. It was a, a literal a cassette tape. Uh, listen to that, uh, a bunch growing up. I mean, I had it for a short time, then uh, got it taken away from me from some uh, babysitter that found out what it was. What it was. And, uh, Funny story about that though, I already doubled it. I like made a burnt copy, you know? <laughs> I was I was uh, not gonna let anyone take the metal away from me. I saw Ace Ventura and I see Cannibal Corpse in it. And I remember being a little kid and, and, and me and my friend were like, kind of like, what is this? You know, we, we never heard, we never saw music like that. So that was my first like eye opener. Cause I, you know, it was right about the time when I was developing interest in it, even though I was very young. And uh, yeah, Cannibal Corpse was the first big one. White Zombie was great, but like Cannibal Corpse, when I found that, I was like, okay, finally, here's something that's just straightforward and, and like, here we go, it's, re it's great. And then I got that, that was, I got that uh, uh, CD at like Myers. Um, and I remember having to like cover up that it had the parental thing on it with like a sticker that was like, this is 12 bucks. And I was like, all right, put that right here. And then uh, took some uh, allowance money, went over there and got it. Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath for the first time at like 3 a.m. at like a sleepover when I was like a little kid and it was scaring me. 
and like getting goosebumps from it. Uh, and I uh, really liked that. And I think that was like a very early moment of being about metal and horror. What's Ozzy mean? Uh, I love Ozzy. I've always loved Ozzy. Uh, like his solo stuff, Black, he's the best in Black Sabbath. And I, I've always loved his like, just his antics. And you know, I, when I was younger, I'd always be watching like documentaries about just all that stuff and reading about it and I used to have an Ozzy shirt that on the back had uh, like a bat flying away with Ozzy's head like decapitated on it uh, and it was one of my favorite shirts uh, so Ozzy means a lot to me <laughs> so I remember picking up Cannibal Corpse Bloodthirst uh, I mean the album cover is just like so intense. I mean, all of Cannibal's albums are like super gory, uh, but that one just like seemed like just like so brutal and over the top. It had this like crazy creature on it, like ripping this guy apart. I always loved horror movies as a kid. Like when I went to like, this is like I'm dating myself now, but like Blockbuster, right? Like I would like, like as a young child, I would like beg my mom to rent me horror movies, like just based off of like the the uh, VHS covers. She's like, no, David, you're gonna get nightmares. And I would like. Like we couldn't leave Blockbuster without me like renting like like a Nightmare on Elm Street or like a, you know Friday the Thirteenth movie or whatever. I would just like there was something about like the, the covers of those horror movies that I was just like super into like as like a young kid. Um, so I think that like definitely like translates to like my my love of metal. Maybe like what got me into metal in the first place, right? It's like I don't know, it's even like food, right? Like you eat with your eyes first, they say, right? So you know you look at like an album cover. Um, and it just like draws you in. I mean, I remember being in like record stores, like even before I was like really getting into death metal. And I remember seeing like the name Cannibal Corpse and pulling out like the Butchered at Birth CD and being like, this is the most fucked up thing I've ever seen. Like, what is this, right? So that makes you like want to get into it more, right? Because it's like, it's like this taboo thing or it's like, oh, you shouldn't be looking at this. It's like super gory and like fucked up. But I don't know, I guess uh, I'm just kind of like, drawn to that it like it really like kind of intrigues me and piques my interest it doesn't have to be like over the top gory it could it could just be like this kind of strange looking painting that makes you feel like uneasy in some way but like you don't know why and in some ways that's maybe even more horrifying right because it's, it's maybe it's you know tugging at some part of your subconscious i don't think i was like aware of this as a kid because you know i'm just I'm, I'm watching the movies for the imagery um and the, and the music obviously is in the background to like, you know, make the scenes that much more tense or that much more terrifying. But the, the composers on some of those horror movies from back in the day were just like, just such amazing uh, writers of music. Like, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's Halloween season right now. So we have some like horror movies like on the, on the bandwagon. And we were watching Friday the 13th part two the other night. And the soundtrack is like incredible on it. Like it's it's all symphonic, like super tense, super evil sounding. Like it almost like sounds like death metal. So I mean, who knows? Maybe like listening to or or watching those movies as a kid and like listening to the soundtracks like kind of in the background maybe influence my taste in music because I love like really bizarre, like tense like classical music. And I wonder if like some of that came from like watching like horror movies as a kid, and if my love of all like really dissonant, fucked up death metal comes from that as well. In 1996, I listened to Jimi Hendrix, and I was like, "Yup, that's it. That's what I want to do." And then from there, you know, I got into uh, my uncle. Like a few years later, my uncle bought me a Injustice for All CD. And I was like, again, I was just like with the headphones in the disc man, and I was just like, yup, mm hmm, that's right. And uh, I don't know, I guess I've always just kind of wanted to do the most extreme, like going from Hendrix to Zeppelin to Metallica, just constantly like yearning for something heavier, darker, more extreme. And then once you get into black metal and death metal and all that shit, I was like, what's more extreme? What's crazier? I want to, I want to. And as a teenager, you're probably just like some fucking, you know, you kind of have that 
uh, metalhead personality where you're like, I want to pride myself on listening to the most extreme music, you know, that, which is so stupid, but like, that's how I was as a kid for sure. And uh, that's kind of where I like taking Imperial is like being one of the most out there fucking bands. That really kicked into gear for me and I'm pretty sure it was 1986 when uh, Master of Puppets, Rain and Blood, and Crossover were out. And a buddy of mine, I always go to this this one thought because it was the one thing that's changed me from uh, some of the, like listening to Rat and stuff like that. You know, I was into some of the hair metal stuff and I was into some Maiden. And, uh, uh, but when I heard uh, this mixtape that had a uh, five-year plan um, Angel of Death and uh, I think it was Disposable Heroes it just everything switched gears again you know it was like I still love all that other shit but as far as what I wanted to do was like holy fuck this is the real shit you know like and and there was a great variety of stuff in all three of those bands you know like DRI had the brutal threat like I don't need to explain it's just it was it's what took me to the next part you know and then, and then I think when, with Obituary and Deicide, a few years later, uh, I was frightened, you know, when I heard some of that shit. But I, was, but I was beyond intrigued, you know. It was like I remember when I first heard Deicide and Glenn Benton screaming Satan, and I didn't know shit about Satan or G or whatever and all that shit. It was ridiculous, but fucking, it was the greatest thing I ever heard. And like I remember listening to it at my girlfriend's uh, house and thinking. Her parents probably think I'm a fucking wacko because this guy's screaming Satan, but I didn't have anything to do with that shit, you know? It's was, it was just fucking awesome, dude. I, that album is still fucking awesome. I got a chance to meet Steve, too, and uh, he was fucking awesome. So it was I was having a total fanboy moment when I met him because the last time, I, I haven't seen him play since uh, 92 in Buffalo, and that was for the Legion tour, and I got it on DV, I got it on video, and it's one of the greatest fucking live sets ever. His banter between the songs is hilarious and brutal. And he and, and his mic gets knocked into his face and he fucking freaks out. And his hair goes crazy. And he's like, bring that fucker to me. And it's like the greatest thing. I got the best samples, man. I get, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's fucking priceless, dude. We had a local band in my hometown that was like, kind of like pretty extreme. It sounded like Cryptopsy, maybe like Fetus kind of. I don't know, of course, like a little metalcore, like every local band of that era. But uh, it was pretty extreme shit. That really opened my mind. But at that show, this other band played called Robinson, and they were like, pretty much just like, you know, just a 10 minute set of just blasting. You know, it was pretty like extreme, especially at 14 in a gym where it's just like, it was so sick. And it was like everything I wanted in music, you know? Cause I was into punk and I was into some death metal and stuff, but like, you know, pretty middle of the lane stuff. That was so extreme to me at the time. Um, that was a big one. And like film wise, I don't know, I guess lately I was thinking again about this movie Begotten. It's like a 1990s like kind of cult sort of horror film about killing God. Um, that was like pretty impactful. I thought that was pretty crazy shit. Uh, and you know, I've revisited as an adult and it's still pretty sick. But I think that got me into some more extreme mediums, you know? When I was 14 years old, I remember going to Best Buy and I bought With Roots Above and Branches Below by The Devil Wears Prada with money that I had earned from allowance. And it's, it's different now, you know, on release day, I still anticipate it the same, but it's different when you have to go to the store, get the physical copy and then take it home and put it in your CD player and listen to it there. It's like this whole other process. Um, and then I would say another one was um, when a friend gifted me the, the Have Heart Last Show DVD, because I was, that happened in 2008, 2009, so I was far too young to have ever traveled to Boston and experienced that. But that was like, I never experienced anything like that. And that was a life-changing moment for me. I now wanted to shift their focus to the future. Were they optimistic about the current state of extreme music? And how could bands further push the boundaries? As a whole right now, it's much more accepting. You know, when we started, it was super elitist. You know, everybody had a very narrow description of what real metal was. And if you went outside of it, well, you're just, 
you know, you're, you're a poser, you're a fake, it's not real, how dare you? You know, I wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how many times people came up to us and like on the early shows, like when 2008 we're opening for Obituary and Unleashed, and we're the one of, and their fans would come up to us and say, how dare you play this music? And they're serious and you're like, like, dude, we have sound clips of 40 year old version in our music. Like, like why, what, you think we're serious people? Like, what is wrong with you, man? <laughs> like, do you know the guys in obituary? You, you know what, what we were doing right before the set? Yeah, no, they're having a, okay, there's this saltine crackers and they're doing the dry cracker challenge. How many crackers can you eat without taking a drink? Like, dude, lose the serious everybody's having fun except you you know but like that was the prevailing attitude and it wasn't just fans revolver decibel all outburn all the magazines they all trashed death Corps, you know just went for it about how you know uh ill-conceived it is how you know unlearned it is just the lowest form of music you can create and it's just like okay I mean, if you got to hate on new stuff, I guess you're old. I don't know, you know? We just kept at it. And what I've really noticed is in the last, man, really it's just the last three, four, five years, is that and finally the attitude is starting to change. And I think with Lorna really getting all the success that they got, suddenly the gatekeepers sort of evaporated. You know, because what are you going to say? Like, people are listening to Death Corps. There's no question about it. I think that song has like freaking 200 million plays on it. It's got some insane number, right? People are listening. So you can't say it's not music anymore, right? And I think it took, fuck, it took 17 years before those gatekeepers finally had to eat their words. And it's like, yeah, Deathcore is a real genre. Suck it. You know, <laughs> I like that, that. That was the reality. And they just didn't want to accept that for so long. And we've got a lot of that hate because we we're always like the freaks of death Corps, you know we we're always trying to do something a little different you know add this add that add the theatrical aspect add the black metal stuff obviously that took off with everybody and it's like yeah that's the whole point of being a musician original artwork right or a, or are we supposed to start a band that sounds like a band from 20 years ago because that's not very original to me Original is, hey, what if I take this kind of music and this kind of music and put them together? Oh, there you go. You got something new. The trajectory of metal is the same if you look at the timeline as jazz and classical music, where it starts off simple with a lot of rules. People start getting faster and faster. Then they start getting more atonal and dissonant because they can't get any faster. It happened with classical. It happened with jazz. It's currently happening with death metal words. People literally can't play any faster. So where do you go? You could go slower, but then soon you'll be too slow. People are going towards more and more dissonant avenues and the listener is getting smarter and more into it, which is perfect for us because there's plenty of bands like Gorguts that I think were definitely ahead of their time and, uh, you know, kind of blaze the trail for bands like us. I get excited when I see bands that don't really care about like what the rules are for whatever genre they're ascribing to. Like uh, even even just in the way they just carry themselves. If a band rolls up and they're just wearing normal ass clothing and they look like nerds and they look like they don't have any friends, I'm like, I'm like, this band's gonna be sick. You know what I mean? I just, I don't think there should be like a visual identity or a sound identity or like rules. So that's what excites me. I think that there's a lot of kind of genre bending that's happening right now. Um, it's a lot more accessible. I think that what we're experiencing right now with like experiencing with TikTok and just how accessible this kind of music is on the internet is really familiar to like what happened in MySpace and um, how it just, you know, became available for all of these different people to listen to this kind of music. And that and I think that, you know, we're seeing more diverse lineups and bands and tours and people working for bands and just within the industry as a whole, we're seeing a lot more inclusiveness as far as like typically marginalized people within the heavy metal community would be. And as well as, you know, there's some pushback, but there's a great amount of acceptance to counteract it. The cool thing about metal is like, you could be in a band, you could be in an anonymous black metal band 
and never tour and still put music out. So, you know, the advent of the internet and file sharing and all that stuff and just even being able to like upload your music to a platform or, um, you know, just contacting a vinyl plant and saying like, all right, here's the file. It's like, will you, will you press this? Um, you can get your music out there and, and never have to tour. I mean, I think there's some people, maybe they're just inherently shy or they're just like, maybe they've toured in the past and they're over it. They've kind of fallen out of love with it. You know, their, their back hurts or whatever. Like I want my, I want to sleep in my bed every night. You know, I get that too, but that is the cool thing about metal and, and how sort of vast the scene is in the underground community. You can have your self-expression and, and, and have your like creative, unique voice and put that out there to the world. And you might have like a huge underground following in a specific genre and never play a single show in your entire life. Wow, you can, you know, really like collaborate with kind of whoever if they have like the, the technology. And I, I think that is probably only going to, you know, continue more like as everyone just kind of comes on board with that more and more and as DAWs become easier to use and I mean it seems like now like if you don't have like a interface and like some type of Pro Tools or Logic or whatever like you're like living in the Stone Age. <laughs> I think like uh, with underground, you know, extreme metal, there's so many like subgenres compared to a lot of other types of music where it kind of is just like one whole thing, and uh, a lot of people can agree on things in in extreme music more. You know, I like this type of black metal, I like death metal, I like grindcore, and uh, you know, everyone has each other's back and stuff like that, no matter what, because we're all kind of misfits. But you know, find a place here. I mean, this is all I really ever wanted to do, so it's kind of made life worth living. I mean. It's, uh, you know, the thing that always got me uh, waking up in the morning. I wanted to wake up and hear the, you know, the same Slayer record again a million times or, you know, even like when I was a kid, System of a Down or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's what I wanted to do. So, I mean, it's, it's really made it possible for me to do everything I wanted to do in my life, travel and play music. What excites me, it just keeps getting heavier, just keeps getting more brutal. I mean, ever, ever since, you know, fucking death started this shit, it just kept getting more progressive. I mean, there's so many different, I guess, versions of extreme metal. You know, you can go in the black metal, death metal territory. Like, it's basically for any type of crowd that's into metal, because not everybody's into black metal or death metal. What's exciting is that, you know, there's something for everybody. It seems like a lot of this extreme music is built around, like, drummers and shit, because, like, all these drummers these days, you know, they're doing this and that, and they're, they're doing this, and there's lots of things going on, and there's 40,000 beats a minute, and f I was like, man, like, uh, some of that shit's just too much. It's, like, too much for me. Like, I like the grind beats to, to, to sit back a little more and to sit in the, in the song right, you know? So you're hearing, I mean, you're hearing everything that's because everything's produced so nice, and there's 50,000 bass drums in this. But there are some bands that do it so tastefully, like Cattle Decapitation. I love them. I mean, that last album is fucking brilliant. So it's like, I feel like that is like almost the pinnacle of as extreme as like I would want it. But extreme could be taken a lot of different ways, you know? There's like the porno grind genre that's, that alone is just extreme, you know? Like, and I'm not really much into that, but, uh, I guess I think of extreme as like just f speed and fast, you know, like, uh, but it can be taken a lot of different ways. I, maybe my take is old school or something, you know, I don't know, but um, I don't know. I like that things are kind of, with some of these throwback bands are starting to slow down a little bit. 
don't know. These guys will probably figure out how to grind even faster and in like grow, you know, attach a fucking stick to their dick or something and gravity blast that. I don't fucking know. I mean, but they're also talented. I don't get it. I mean, like same with guitar players. They're all over YouTube. Everyone can fucking play everything. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. This shit is intense. But it is brutal, you know. Having discussed the power of this genre and the struggles of making it in the industry, we wanted to open the floor for people to share their stories and explain why they continue to pursue music. After exploring why this music resonates with so many, it was clear that it is a safe space to build relationships, express emotions, and find commonalities that unite us all. It is a powerful tool that has changed lives and will continue to do so in the future.